next speaker is Laura Ciazadlo. And Laura, Laura's family had a long history of breast and stomach cancer. Genetic testing revealed a CDH1 gene mutation associated with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer and lobular breast cancer. Uh, to, to prevent stomach cancer, Laura chose to have a prophylactic gastrectomy. <coughs> Laura lives in Libertyville, Illinois, with her husband and two daughters. She has been a board member for No Stomach for Cancer since 2015. And Laura is here uh, to speak to us and is part of our partnership uh, for this conference with No Stomach for Cancer. So Laura, if you could come up. I'm sure there's lots of people that are very anxious to hear you speak. Thanks, um, everyone, for having me. Um, so my total gastrectomy was uh, 12 years ago, so you'd think that telling my story would be um, old hat for me at this point, but um, this is actually my first time telling it um, to, to a group and in public, so bear with me a little bit. Um, stomach cancer has taken many lives uh, from my family. So on the... I guess your left there is my grandfather. He was diagnosed with, with uh, what they originally thought was ulcers. He died at age 51. Um, the middle picture is my Aunt Bonnie. That's my mom's sister. She died when she was just 33 years old from diffuse stomach cancer. And then the far right is my Aunt Sandra. She died when she was 65 in 2005. Um, again, from diffuse stomach cancer, but um, my Aunt Sandra's story would be different from the others, not for her personally, um, but for our extended family and for all future generations to come, because it was through her work with the genetics department at the hospital that it was discovered that our family carries the CDH1 genetic mutation. So let me rewind back to 2005. So after previously fighting through two rounds of breast cancer, both ductal and lobular, my Aunt Sandra was diagnosed with late stage stomach cancer. The cancer had metastasized to, from her stomach to her surrounding organs and the outlook was not good. It was during a visit I had with Sandra in the hospital that a gentleman came in and introduced himself as a genetics counselor that Sandra had been working with. He explained that the cancer my aunt suffered from was diffuse stomach cancer that can be caused by a genetic mutation he said that because this particular cancer is so hard to detect that many people who test positive for the mutation have their stomach removed as a preventative measure. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Don't people know that modern medicine can um, detect these things if there's proper surveillance? He went on to explain that Sandra had opted to be tested for the gene mutation. And while the results weren't back yet, if she did test positive, there would be implications for the rest of our family. So at that point, I heard what he was saying to me, but um, it didn't really register to me at that point what the impact could be on my health and my family's health, partly probably because I was focusing on the, the little time we had left with Sandra. So my Aunt Sandra passed away in October of 2005. And then a few months later, on Christmas Day, my mom gathered me and my two brothers and our spouses around the table and announced that Sandra had tested positive for the CDH1 mutation, and that she, along with her two remaining living sisters, had also tested positive. So my mom was one of five girls, so at this point, two had passed from stomach cancer, and the three living had tested positive for the CDH1 mutation. So needless to say, shockwaves went through not only our immediate family, but our extended family, we learned, all going to different genetic counselors, that a carrier, now this was 2005, so my statistics are a few years old, but um, at that time, a carrier of this mutation had an over 80% chance of getting diffuse stomach cancer. It, uh, diffuse stomach cancer, I think, as we've heard, is a cancer that's so hard to detect because it grows in the lining of the stomach and then stretches out 
to um, other organs before it can be detected. At that point, the five-year survival rate after diagnosis was quoted at 10%. So over the course of the next few months, myself and my cousins, so the next generation down, got tested. Um, my female cousins, and if there's a genetics counselor in here, I want them to calculate <laughs> the probability of this, this, what I'm gonna describe happening. So my two female cousins and I tested positive. My two brothers and my two male cousins all tested negative. So technically the mutation doesn't have a gender bias, but I still wonder with my family's um, results. So we all got our results, and my two brothers were negative, and I was happy for those who tested negative, but I'll be very honest, I was also a bit jealous. Uh, not jealous, less so um, that they personally wouldn't have to deal with it, but more so that their future generations wouldn't have to deal with it. So my kids at the time were ages one and three, and I wanted them to be in the clear of this, but they weren't. At the genetics appointment where I found out I had tested positive for CDH1, I also found out that in addition to the risk of stomach cancer, the mutation also carried with it about a 50% chance of getting lobular breast cancer. And receiving genetic information is often referred to as a gift, and logically, I get it. It's, it's valuable information that can benefit our health. Um, I have to tell you, though, when I sat across from that genetics counselor and heard the news, it felt more like a punch to the gut, not like receiving a gift. At that moment, I was not grateful for the gift I had received. So I let myself be mad and sad for a few days, but then moved on to the practical side of what to do next. Medical protocol was to have a total gastrectomy or your whole stomach removed. My cousins, Amy and Julie, who tested positive, had lost their mom when she was just 33. They decided to have the surgery. My Aunt Judy also decided to have the surgery. She had lost a sister and a father to this. My mom opted not to have the surgery, mostly because she was 70 years old, and at the time, the increased, um, because of her age, the increased rigor of the surgery and the risk of surgery itself seemed like too much for her. So I grappled with the decision to have surgery or not, mostly because my mom was already 70 and hadn't been impacted by stomach cancer yet. So I wondered if there was something in her genes that counteracted the impact of the mutation that would protect me as well but I ultimately decided to go through with the surgery. The thing that pushed me over the edge was my two girls who were ages one and three at the time. I had to be around for them. If I opted not to have surgery, then later got diffuse stomach cancer, it would be likely too late for me to recover from it. That was not an option for me. So into the coming weeks, I went into research mode. I met with three different surgeons at three different hospitals, hoping one would feel right. I discussed my options with several surgeons. The, the decisions that you go through, as you guys know, at that point, there's so many, and it's overwhelming both emotionally and just logically. So trying to understand, should I have a pouch built or not have a pouch? Should I opt to try to go laparoscopic or go straight to open? What hospital, what surgeon? It was, it was overwhelming to say the least. Um, I ultimately decided to have my surgery at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in October of 2006. The care I received was great, uh, but the recovery was grueling, as some has, have said. I remember being so frustrated that no one could tell me what foods would work with my new system. They said trial and error was the best way, and when you are weak and dehydrated and not feeling well, that is not what you want to hear. You want to hear what will work, and the, the truth of it was you just had to figure it out. I remember the effort involved in just trying to eat and digest one scrambled egg or a piece of toast. I had flashbacks to when I tried to get my Aunt Sandra to eat more after her surgery, and I understood why what used to be a swift routine of devouring meals now became a daunting task that was more chore than pleasure. So as I recovered from the stomach surgery, I made a plan to deal with the breast cancer risk primarily through um, surveillance. So I was fortunate to get into an imaging study at University of Chicago for women at high risk of breast cancer. My mom and I enrolled in the study. Uh, the study protocol was written for BRCA carriers, but once they saw me crying in the waiting room after the one person told me I couldn't be in the study, so the doctor came back and they said um, they were gonna rewrite the protocol to, 
<laughs> to um, include CDH1. So, so that at least that part of it was a relief that I would have the proper um, surveillance that included regular MRIs, mammograms, and ultrasound. So as I got better and I settled into what my new normal was without a stomach, I began to take closer note of health-related fundraisers in my community. My friends and acquaintances who had been impacted by everything from breast cancer to juvenile arthritis were taking charge of their situations and activating our community to raise awareness and funds for their respective causes. I should do the same, I thought. I pictured myself going public with my story, the CDH1 mutation and its impact on my family, but I, I couldn't do it. While it didn't bother me to think about people knowing what I had gone through, I didn't want to go public with the genetic piece of the picture. Then everyone would know about the risk that my two girls faced while they were none the wiser. Sarah was just one and Emily three at that point, and it just didn't seem fair. I had no idea when or how I was going to let my girls know about their risk, but I couldn't fathom the information being out there. It would make it too real. They had to get the information from me, and I wasn't sure when they would be ready for it. So I gladly supported others' causes, but couldn't bring uh, myself to put mine out there. I struggled with what was the right age to tell them. As they grew older, they saw my scar, and I told them I'd had some surgery, but not why. They knew I couldn't eat a lot of sugar, that sometimes I had to lay down after meals, and other times I needed uh, to eat peanut butter and put a wet washcloth on my head to feel better. But, but they didn't know what their future, that their future may hold the same thing someday. Over the years, and through my involvement in No Stomach for Cancer, I got to know other CDH1 carri car carriers and hear their story. I realized that most of their children were fully informed of the genetic risk as well as the blood tests that could be for performed. I, again, second-guessed my approach with my girls. Was I withholding too much from them? or was I preserving their care for years? My older daughter uh, has definitely inherited my knack for worrying about anything and everything, and I fear that I'd be taking away her youth if she had this genetic testing looming over her. In the meantime, I continued to monitor my breast cancer risk with regular MRIs, mammograms, and clinical exams. And every six months when I had this screening, for the prior 11 years since I was first diagnosed with CDH1, so this is about 2016 at this point, um, so for those 11 years, every six months, my results had come back clear with one exception, I had a call back. So it was great, my results were coming back clear, but I noticed that my reaction to receiving my results started to change over the years, and as I would get the call, I would be surprised when they told me that my results were clear, and um, it was like I was just waiting to get cancer. Um, in, in the meantime, around that same time, my mom had been diagnosed with, with um, lobular breast cancer, so although she wasn't impacted by stomach cancer, or knock on wood has not been yet, she was impacted with um, lobular breast cancer. So I knew the, the risk had weighed more on me than I had thought. <laughs> So in 2017, I decided to have a double mastectomy and put the full CDH1 risks behind me. So when I had my stomach surgery, my girls were just one and three years old, so they didn't know what was going on. They didn't need to be in, no, they just know mom was at the hospital and she was back. At this point now, though, um, they were 12 and 14, and I had to tell them what I was going to do and why I was going to do it. So... I'm not always an optimist at heart, but I thought I'm gonna try to make this a good thing and at the time I tell them about the breast surgery, I'm gonna bring in the stomach surgery again and this time make the link back to the, genetic, um, the genetics piece of it. So I proposed to my husband that in the same conversation we were telling the girls about why I was having the breast surgery because of familial risk, and then that we could relate it back to the stomach surgery, and then I also did that to reduce my risk of cancer, just to give them some more information so they could start to put the picture together. Because at this point, they knew I had stomach surgery, but didn't know the family risk part of the picture. So my husband's response to this approach was, I don't want to hit them with a double whammy. Let's take one thing at a time and just explain the breast piece at the first conversation. So... 
I had to respect his approach, so I agreed. So one afternoon, we sat the girls down to tell them about the breast surgery. My husband and I sat on the couch, and my girls, true to form, for siblings decided to fight over the one beanbag chair, <laughs> alternately pushing each other off and claiming their spot. We told the girls that I was going to have my breasts removed and reconstructed so I'd never get breast cancer. I told them it was a decision I made with my doctor after evaluating my health and my family history. I was in shock at my seventh grader's initial reaction. How much is this gonna cost? <laughs> she asked. My eighth grader's first reaction was, are my friends going to find out about this? So we talked a bit more about um, when I'd be going to the hospital and some of the other details, and I was thinking the conversation was going pretty well. It was about that time, we started to bake cookies before we had the conversation, we didn't plan it out very well. So the cookies started burning in the oven, and my husband runs to get the cookies out of the oven, the girls are fighting over the beanbag chair. I run after my husband saying, this is going pretty well, can we bring in, can we do the double whammy, can I bring in the stomach thing? And he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, it's going pretty well, it's going pretty well. So um, we went back in and I told him that I had my stomach surgery for a similar reason so I wouldn't get cancer, it was a decision I made with my doctor after evaluating family risk as well as my own health. Um, by that time, I think their attention span had waned a little bit and it wasn't the long, impactful discussion I had imagined I knew the family risk concept, though, was getting at least in um, to my older daughter, who at one point in the conversation turned to reprimand her sister and said, Sarah, you better listen because we might have to do this someday. <laughs> um, so I had a double mastectomy with reconstruction a little over a year ago. Surgery and recovery went fine, and it was uh, nice to get that looming worry of cancer off my shoulders. My two girls are now 15 and 13. They know I've had my stomach and breasts removed to prevent cancer and that it tends to run in our family, but they don't yet know about the genetic testing available to determine their risk. The next few years will be critical for me to educate them on CDH1 without scaring them. I went back to the genetics office a year ago to get connected again to the counselors and medical team with the thought of establishing a relationship with a counselor who could eventually talk to my girls. I still don't know if my approach is the right one or if at some point my girls will be upset that I didn't tell them sooner and I pray that I've given them enough tidbits of information along the way that when they do learn of the genetic test, it won't feel like a punch in the gut, but rather a logical next step in evaluating health decisions as they get older. The one thing I do know now is that the genetic information my Aunt Sandra gave to our family is truly a gift, one for which I am grateful and thankful. <laughs> Me and my husband and my two girls. Yeah, I just wasn't sure, like, at what age can your daughters be tested? For so that? they, um, with genetic counseling, they say, they, they, they say the, um, 18 is when they would first test for it. Unless, you know, they take, you have to take the person in your family that had the youngest incidence of cancer. For me, that was my Aunt Bonnie at 33. 33. Take 10 years off of that, yeah. you get to 23. And that's when my girls should start thinking about it. So if there was a family where it happened at somebody at 25, then maybe you have to have the conversation at 15. But you know, they, they want them to be able to participate in the decision. And personally, my girls will know by that point, but I still feel like at 18, it was, I, I learned this news at 33, and I still can't get through it without crying. So yeah. I, I don't think there's ever an age where you're really really mm -hmm. ready, but, but the counselors say at least wait till they're 18. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Laura.